children can now go to the children's program. Of writing uh, ask for a different type of response. 
and you need to have a certain kind of mindset depending on what you're reading. When you're reading satire, you're not thinking these are facts, right? You're getting ready to laugh because you understand this is not a serious news article. So I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I'm probably not the only one who has difficulty with the Book of Psalms. I'm sure uh, there's some of you here who, you know, you can read the, the theological books, but then when you get to Psalms and all the, the songs and poetry, it, it just doesn't really do anything for you. And that's the way it is, it, it is for me most of the time. And over the next few weeks, what I want to do is uh, I really want to go deeper into the Book of Psalms. Uh, I want us to begin to understand this is for me too, because you know, I, I am weak in this area. Uh, but I want all of us to really take the time to go deeper into Psalms. And the first step is learning how to read Psalms. Now, you learn how to read Psalms when you understand the purpose of the book. And the Psalms are both for teaching and for feeling. I want you to understand this. Uh, it's for teaching and for feeling. So you can't go into the book of Psalms and say, I want to just learn something. That can't be the only thing you're looking for. You have to also be willing to feel something. Now, this is why the book of Psalms is so hard for me. Because the way I'm wired, I am not emotionally strong. That's not my strong point. I'm not a good, uh, I, don't, I don't pick up on feelings very well. But I'm very logical and my mind works fast. So I tend to want to learn. So when I read the Psalms and I read a song about loneliness, uh, it's hard because I'm trying to learn something, but what I'm really supposed to do is I'm supposed to step into the shoes of that person who was lonely. I'm supposed to feel that loneliness. The feeling of abandonment by God, the feeling of abandonment by other people. And I'm supposed to experience that. But what's unique about the Psalms is that unlike poetry, so poetry usually doesn't have this motive, but the Psalms are also meant to teach us something about God, something about us, and something about the reason that we exist. And so there is both a teaching element to it, and there is a feeling element to it. So for me, when I was just trying to learn from the Psalms, uh, I wasn't really understanding the Psalms. I wasn't really being fully blessed because I was confused. Like, what am I supposed to do about this Psalm where this guy is really angry and he wants to hurt people? How am I supposed to be blessed by this? I don't understand. Am I supposed to want to hurt people? Like, is this what I'm supposed to do? This guy wants to like punch people in the face, and I'm reading this, and I'm, how is this supposed to be a devotional for me? But now I'm beginning to understand. I'm supposed to step into his life and see. There are times when I'm, I get really upset, and I say, God, there are all these people who are against me. Can you stand up for me? Right? That's that, that, that sense of uh, righteous indignation. So when I began to let the Psalms touch my emotions, uh, I began to actually uh, get deeper with God in a way that I didn't expect. Uh, I began to uh, have a sense of compassion that I didn't have before. So, the, so you know, we read the Psalms both to teach, teach something and to feel something. One of the struggles that I had with the Psalms is are they worth my time? And I want to explain this to you. Uh, you know, I've always loved learning and escaping by reading books. That's something that uh, when I was young, I really loved to do. I would just sit in my room and I would just read all day, uh, escaping to different worlds. But I never got into poetry. I don't know why it is. I loved reading, but I could never read poetry. It just, it didn't do it for me. And I didn't see why I was so great. So I have this distrust of emotions. Like it, I feel like emotions aren't as great as, as facts and things you can touch. And the Psalms are all about emotions. The Psalms is a very emotional book. Sadness, rage, loneliness, grief, confusion, joy, and all this range of emotions 
And it felt strange to call a song uh, where someone was questioning God and saying, God, why are you like this? God, why are you like that? And say that that is the Word of God. There were times when I had read that and I said, how is this the Word of God when it's questioning God? It, it just felt like, is this really worth my time? Shouldn't I be reading theology? Shouldn't I be reading something a little bit more meaningful? Uh, but as is the case most of the time, what helped me uh, to really come back to a proper respect for the Psalms uh, was Jesus. Jesus was the answer. Uh, you see, what I saw was that Jesus actually quotes from Psalms many times. And I realized that if I trust Jesus, then I need to trust the Psalms. I cannot say, I trust Jesus, but I don't really trust the Psalms, and yet Jesus trusts the Psalms. I want to show you a few passages where we can see this. If we can have the Bible passages up. Okay. Uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 36. David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, this is Jesus speaking, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Uh, he was quoting from Psalm 110, verse 1. Next is John chapter 10, verses 34 to 35. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If ye call them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken. Uh, this is quoted from Psalm 82, verse 6. John chapter 13, verse 18. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. He's quoted from Psalm 41, verse 9. Now, let me show you guys what he's using these psalms for. The first one, Jesus is using the psalm to defend his identity. He's saying, I am the Son of God. Just look at this psalm. The second one, he's saying, the psalms are scripture. It is the word of God, and it cannot be broken. And so there he is saying a very, very uh, powerful thing about what the psalms is to him. It is something that cannot be broken. Uh, it cannot be corrupted, it cannot be broken, it is the Word of God. The third thing he points out is, he shows how the psalm predicted a future event. He says, you see what this psalm said? This is going to come true today. Now, that is some very, very powerful usage of the book of Psalms. Uh, a book that I <laughs> very little respect for, that I would often just skim through. If Jesus has such respect for the authority of the Psalms, pointing out how even one word, you see that word Lord, you see that word God, how it's used in that context, and he says this is super significant. That one word makes all the difference. If you see how much respect and authority he gives it, how can we call Jesus Lord and yet dismiss a book that Jesus himself used to defend himself. I mean, this, is, this is not something that you just skim through. Every word, Jesus was pointing out every word and saying, this is significant, this has weight, this has meaning. So either Jesus is wrong about the Psalms and you can't trust Jesus, or you are wrong about the Psalms. And your understanding, your perspective of the Psalms is distorted in some way, is, is broken in some way. I knew as I was studying this, that was the case for me. Now, if Jesus is my Lord, then the Psalms have to be an integral part, a very important part of my relationship with Jesus. Uh, if it's not, I need to think about how to make it something very important to me. Now, I want to just give this illustration. If, if I was in a discussion with someone about the field of physics, maybe I was talking about, uh, I don't know, the speed of light and how uh, that affects the way we can travel through, travel through space. And I said, you know, 
you know, in, in, in the midst of our discussion, I said, you know, well, uh, I have this one person, I have this one source, uh, my best friend, who told me that this and this is true. Now, how trustworthy is it if you don't know my friend? And you, you might believe it. You could say, okay, maybe he knows what, what he's talking about, but you might doubt it, or you might say, well, you know, maybe he doesn't really know what he's talking about, you know, where did he get his information? But what if I showed you an article from NASA or from a <coughs> professor with a PhD in the field of physics? If I gave you that article and it was different from what you previously believed, then even if you had a different argument and you said, I believe it's this, and the article showed you that it's not that, then because of the authority of that source that you just received, you have to change your ideas. Because you understand this is an indisputable source. This source has authority. This is NASA. This is a guy who has a PhD in physics. A greater authority has come into the discussion. And so you need to change what you believe. So if Jesus is the greatest authority, if you're a Christian, you believe that, right? As a Christian, you trust Jesus is my highest authority. He is the law for my life. And he uses the Psalms to defend himself. And he is viewing the Psalms as an authority equal to himself. Now there's only one way this is possible. They are the real words of God. They are His words. They are His spoken word. That is why they have equal authority. And when you encounter words with that kind of authority, right, you don't change those words, or you don't say that this is what this should mean. Uh, no. Whenever those words come into your life, they change you. If you had a different idea, that is the great authority. That authority has a right to change your views. Now, in our reading from today, we hear a very big claim. This is a very big promise. Verses 1 to 2, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now we're told here, you will be blessed. You will be blessed if you delight in the law of God and meditate on it day and night. You will be blessed. Now, uh, I want to just explain the word blessed to you because sometimes we hear the word blessed uh, and it's not the full meaning of the word. Blessed means total fulfillment. Complete fulfillment, a deep sense of well-being. So it is a very powerful word about your sense of uh, satisfaction and fulfillment in your life. And when you hear the word law, right, it says, blessed is the one who meditates on the law. Uh, I want you to understand, law does not mean just legal statements. Uh, the law was also called Torah in the Jewish language. And so there was that parallel there. So it included all of God's instruction and teaching, not just the laws themselves, not just the Ten Commandments, but all of the things that teach us about God and how we live our lives. So when you hear meditating on the law, it is all of God's teaching. Don't just think, oh, these are just the legal statements. So the promise is, if I, if I can explain it one more time in different language, it is, you will experience total and complete fulfillment in God if you delight in the whole of Scripture and meditate on it day and night. This is the promise. Now, if the key to blessing is meditation, how do we do this? How do we do this thing called meditation? Right? If, if that is the key to really experiencing true fulfillment in this life. How do we do this thing? I think a lot of us uh, don't really get meditation. And I'm guilty of this too. Uh, you know, there was a season in my ministry uh, when I was doing youth ministry when 
everything I read, everything I learned, I automatically thought about how I was going to teach it. That became my automatic, uh, like the automatic thing that I turned to as soon as I learned something. If I heard a great story, if I read something in a book, if I did a devotional, if I listened to a sermon, everything was just geared towards, okay, how am I going to use this? How am I going to teach this someday? But just learning or even just teaching is not meditation. That is, that is not what meditation is. You know, I had, I had an Old Testament professor in seminary. I may have shared this with some of you, but uh, my Old Testament professor, he obviously knew the Old Testament better than anyone else in the classroom. You know, he is a professor. But he didn't meditate on the Old Testament. He didn't allow it to shape him. You know how I knew this? Because he was constantly mocking the Old Testament. He was a genius. He was a super genius scholar about when it came to the Old Testament. But he was mocking it. He was you know, treating it like it was just any old history text. Why? Because in his mind, his authority was greater than the authority of the Old Testament. He was the great authority. So he was judging the Old Testament, saying, this is foolishness. So he would mock it. He would openly make fun of it during his lectures. And I remember one student got up. Uh, I remember I remember her. Uh, well, I probably shouldn't say her name just in case. But uh, she was this fierce lady. Uh, and I'm still amazed that she had the courage to stand up in the middle of the class and say this. But she said, how are we supposed to teach from the Old Testament with the way that you're treating it in this class? And you know, I think a lot of us in the classroom were feeling that. And he basically said, that's not my job. I'm not here to do that for you. I'm just here to teach it. He taught it as a text. He didn't teach it as an authoritative text. It was just a book. It was not a book that was going to change his life. It filled his mind. His mind was filled with Old Testament. I mean, that was what he thought about all the time. It was filling his mind, but it was not changing his mind. There is a very big difference between the two. Many of us, we are filled with the Bible. We are not changed <coughs> by the Bible in the same extent that we are filled by it. Some of you may feel, as I used to, that meditation is mainly study. Right? It is studying the Word of God. Uh, so if you don't learn something new, or if there's not something um, special or inspirational, then uh, you know you may feel that well, this is not really meditation. I need to you know learn something significant. But meditation is not studying or learning. Some of you may look at scripture and think mainly it's about how you feel about it, right? Okay, so when I do meditation, and if it's a good meditation, then I feel something. I feel this this thing in my heart. It's like I don't know, it's spiritual, like I feel like I met God, I feel happier, I feel more peace, and yes, that can happen, God can do that for you. But meditation is not sitting in front of the Word and just feeling something. That is not the criteria for meditation. Meditation, like the Psalms, is really a combination of both. But it's not so simple just to say that it engages both the heart and the mind, and the feelings and the intellect. That, that's, that's a little too simple. And I'm going to explain it by using the imagery in our verse to help you understand how it is both an engagement of the heart and mind, but it goes a little bit deeper. There's, a, uh, there's an illustration that you need to understand. Verse 3 of our psalm says, He is like a tree. <clears throat> Okay, so just to just remind you, before this, it said you need to meditate on the Word of God day and night. Okay, so now verse 3 is telling you what that looks like. It's saying, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that He does, He prospers. So a person who meditates is like a tree by a stream of water. Now, does a tree decide, I want this kind of water? Does a tree decide, I want only this much water? Does a tree decide, I want water at this particular time? 
No, a tree just feeds. A tree just receives, it ingests. It turns the water, which is its food, into the power for life and creation. It brings the water into itself, and that water right, is broken down and goes into its cells and produces life. So this is an important distinction. Distinction. I need you uh, to see this. See, my Old Testament professor, he also took the word of God and he examined it, he pulled it apart, right? He, he, he looked at the different parts of the word, but he never ate it. He never ingested it. And he had conditions. Okay, well, you know, I might respect this a little more, but I'm the gatekeeper. I'm the authority on the Old Testament. This text is under my, under my authority. So I'm going to take this, but I'm not going to take too much of that. So he decided what I want to focus on, what I want to pay attention to, what I want to reflect on. But a tree doesn't do that. A tree cannot restrict the food that it receives. It just receives the flow. The flow comes and it just keeps coming. It just, it's rooted there and it just receives it. It also breaks down the food, the water, but that water becomes part of its identity. Right? If you look at a tree, all the cells in a tree, the building blocks of those cells are the food, the water, the nutrient that it ingests. That is who the tree is. So the meditated word, when you meditate on the word, uh, it changes and it transforms both how you think and how you feel. So it isn't so much a question of what, if I'm reading this, is it going to be thought provoking? Or if I'm reading this, is it going to make me feel a certain way? But rather, it's more allowing the Word of God to come and transforming your thoughts, transforming the way your feelings work. Do you see that? It, it's not so much, and is this going to make me think in an interesting way? Or is this going to make me feel an interesting thing? It is more, is this word going to come into me and transform my very thinking process and my feeling process? Is it going to change the way from inside out how I view the world, myself, and others? Martin Luther, uh, the, the leader of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, some of you may know who he is, uh, he is a man that Martin Luther King Jr. was named after. So he is a very, very famous man. Um, he was a theologian who also uh, wrote a guideline for meditation. And if you look at your uh, bulletins for today, you'll actually find it on the back. I included it in all the bulletins. But Martin Luther, uh, what he said was, when I read the Bible, I'm going to meditate on every word until my heart grows hot, until my heart starts to burn. Uh, and he used this thing called text. Uh, and you'll see it up on the, on the screen. These were the four questions he asked uh, when he meditated on the Word of God. He said, he asked himself, what is the teaching of this Word? How can I adore God? What sin can I confess based on this word? And what can I ask God for based on this word? So this is supplication. Uh, supplication is a little bit of a more difficult word, so I just use a simpler word there. But this spells out text. So my encouragement to you all is the next time you, you read scripture or hear teaching on scripture, uh, this is how you should meditate on. This is how you become a tree planted by streams of water. Now, let me just kind of give you a, a very practical uh, overview of what this would look like. Let's say I use this for verse 3 of our Bible passage. So verse 3 is about uh, uh, the tree, right? the tree receiving the water. Let's say I use verse 3. I would say for teaching, I would say, well, I see that I'm supposed to be receiving the word of God like a tree. 
Uh, and so I see that, I understand that uh, being rooted like a tree is the way that I can experience greater blessing. blessing. I need to meditate day and night like a tree rooted by streams of flowing water. So this is what I need to do. I need to become like that tree, rooted, receiving it day and night. Adoration. God, it's, it's amazing that you've made yourself knowable, that you, you have showed us how to get to know you better. Uh, thank you for your word that corrects me. Thank you for your word that gives me life, like streams of living water. Confession. God, you know, I repent. Uh, I, I repent for planting myself in other streams instead of your stream. I repent that uh, many times I, I don't respect the book of Psalms like I'm supposed to. I repent that I neglect the living water. Supplication, asking God, God, would you help me to meditate on your word day and night? Give me the discipline, give me the self-control to really meditate deeply on your word so that I can experience fulfillment in you. You see how that works? You can go through those different steps. And it takes you deeper. And it's more than just learning. You see that you're, you're asking for inner transformation. You're asking for your very thinking to change. You're asking for your, your emotional responses to change. So part of the blessing of meditation is that you really become like this tree. You become like a tree. Uh, there's a reason that the psalmist calls the wicked chaff in verse 4. I'll, I'll just read verse 4 for you. So this is the verse right after uh, the verse on meditation, it says, The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Now, uh, I don't know if you know what chaff is, but chaff is kind of like, like dust. Uh, it just, you know, it's just stuff that flies around in the air. It has no weight. It has no roots. It's at the mercy of whatever the conditions are. If it's windy, it's going to blow more. If it's not windy, it may settle down. But what is a tree? A tree is grounded. A tree is stable. A tree is rooted. A tree is very hard to move. So meditation on the word makes us like trees. People of substance. People of character. Integrity. What is a person of integrity? When you talk to someone and that person's like, I really believe this, I really believe that, I don't know, that you need to go to college. Going to college is everything. And then the next day they're like, you know what, college is terrible. You know, forget about that. Don't go to college. And then a week later, you know what, I think I changed my mind. College is really important. I think you really need to go to college. If you met someone like that, you would say, something about that person. Right? They're just kind of flowing with what they might feel or what they hear from day to day. Uh, or if you talk to someone and they talk to you about their convictions, right? I really believe that marriage, you need to be with one man and one woman. And then the next week they're like, you know what, it's alright if you cheat on someone, it's alright if you fool around. You look at someone like that and you say, that person likes integrity. They're not stable. They, they say one thing and they say the next, and there's, there's no stability there. Meditation on the Word of God makes us people of integrity. We're stable. The winds of culture, the winds of what's popular, your, your desires, right? we all have desires that come and go. Your desires, you're not at the mercy of your desires and your emotions in the moment. We are not stable roots. You know, one of the greatest gifts that God has given me as a pastor is to care far less for some of the things that I used to really care about. Some of the things that I cared so deeply for kept me from being rooted. Because the moment that something happened to that thing that I cared about, I was whisked away. I was pulled in one direction or the next. I don't know if you have things like that in your life where because of those few things or the things you really care about, you can't really stay rooted. It's like it pulls you out every time and it drags you across 
you know, sometimes you're really happy, sometimes you're miserable, sometimes your life is great, sometimes your life is terrible, and it's based on those things that you care so much about, and you can't get rooted. Right? You're like chaff, you're getting blown around. And one of the things I'm most grateful for in my walk with God is God has helped me to let go of those things. And I'm getting more and more rooted, more and more stable. I'm able to focus on what is truly right, what is truly correct. The Word of God roots us so that our cares and our priorities are formed by the Word of God, not by the wind of our desires and the many messages that we hear in culture. One of the other blessings of a tree is a person who meditates can become a healthy tree that bears fruit. Now, notice that the psalm doesn't say, it doesn't say delight and meditate on God's word and then you won't act wickedly. That's not what it says. It doesn't say do these things and then you won't be a wicked person. You see, this is not about you doing something. It is about you becoming something. Do you see that? It is very intentional that the Book of Psalms doesn't have that connection there. And when you become a healthy, fruit-bearing tree, you produce fruit. You don't have to work at it. You don't have to pick the fruit. If you are a healthy tree, if you become a meditating person, you will produce fruit. You will produce good works. This is the other blessing that you get when you really meditate. You become a healthy tree. And again, this is the vision of our ministry. If you think about what is it that MEM wants to do, man at EM wants to do, we want to empower people. So we just don't we, don't, we don't want people to just know things. We don't want people to just do things. We want to help people become someone. Become the person that God is calling to be. Now, where is Jesus in all of this? And I'm going to close with this. There are two ways to see Jesus in this passage. Number one, uh, this passage makes the distinction between the righteous and the wicked. And so it's saying there are people who are righteous and there are people who are wicked. But in another psalm, we see no one is righteous. Not even one. Now which one is right? Is it that they are righteous and they are wicked? Or is it that everyone's wicked and no one is righteous? When you read those two statements in the same book and you say, aren't those two things contradiction? How can those two things both be the Word of God? But this is what we see in the cross, right? The cross condemns us to sinners. When we see the cross, the reason Jesus was on the cross dying is because we are sinners. So his, his death on the cross condemns us. It reveals we are sinners. But through his death and through his resurrection on our behalf, not only does he take away our sin, but he has also become our righteousness. So while the cross says you are a sinner, the cross also says through the resurrection that because he has taken away your sin and given you his righteousness, you are now a righteous person. It is both and at the same time. Here's the second way that we see Jesus in this passage. Jesus, if you're familiar with this, some of you may know what I'm talking about. Jesus once offered a woman water. A woman came up to him at the well and said, give me something to drink. I want, I want, I want what it is that you're offering. And Jesus said, I'll give you water. And then she said, how are you going to give me water when you don't have a bucket? And he said, I am the water. It's me. I'm the living water. In the book of John, if you read the beginning of the book of John, it says, Jesus is the Word. Jesus 
is the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was there in creation. The Word is what enabled creation. Jesus is also the meditation of the Word. When you meditate on, on something, when you meditate on Scripture, what is it that you're doing? You're taking that, that raw material, you're bringing it into yourself, and it's producing fruit. It's producing something of substance, right? Jesus is the meditation of the Word. He is the Word that became flesh. He is the Word that became a body. He is living water that produces fruit. You see that? You're seeing the same imagery over and over again in the Bible. I want you to see that it's not just an isolated illustration. In the same way, when we ingest the Word, it changes us. So Jesus, He shows us what the full embodiment of the Word in us looks like. When we fully embody the Word and we make it our identity, that is Jesus. Jesus is the Word became flesh. That is what we're all aiming for. That is what empowerment looks like. That is why we read the Bible and meditate on it, because that is where we get the power to be transformed as we reflect on it and ingest it and allow it to become who we are. And this is why also Jesus told his disciples as he looked at the entirety of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, and Revelation wasn't written yet, but uh, from Genesis to everything that was written to that point, he looked at all of Scripture and he said, all of this is talking about me because he is the Word. Now, the application for all of this is I want us together as a church to really help each other get rooted in the Word like a tree planted in a stream of water. And, you know, as I showed you, I typed out uh, Martin Luther's guide on meditation and I've listed some psalms and I've listed a psalm for each day of the week. Uh, and you know, one of the beautiful things about church, and I hope you guys take advantage of this, is that you have people around you who understand what it is to be a Christian, and they can encourage you uniquely in your faith. You know, maybe you have non-Christian friends, maybe you have friends who don't believe in the same things you do. They can't encourage you in the faith, but the people here can. So when we say, let's do something together, I don't want you to think like, I'm like forcing you to do it. I want you to think of it as an opportunity to do what the church is called to do. Like encouraging one another, moving together, growing together, journeying together. So this week, uh, I encourage you to, uh, as a church, uh, why don't we try doing this together? Why don't we try uh, applying these principles, asking these questions as we meditate, and really focusing on these psalms together. And I picked, I purposely picked a psalm that deals with a different topic. So each psalm that you read this week uh, is going to focus on a different emotion or a different situation. Uh, so you'll get a variety of different uh, contexts here. And I really look forward to uh, hearing back from all of you after a week. Maybe some of you will have experienced something new through the psalm. Maybe some of you will feel convicted in a new way, uh, but I hope uh, to see all of you becoming more and more rooted in the Word of God. If I can ask the peace prayer to come up at this time, and we're just going to spend some time uh, praying now and responding to the message. If you can close your eyes, and we're just going to